And next up, we have April Edwards. April is a senior software engineer and cloud advocate for Microsoft, specializing in data center modernization and application transformation. Whew, that was a mouthful. <laughs> Her focus is advocating the cloud to customers and taking them on a journey to what is possible in the cloud, which from personal experience has been a rather hot topic over the last few years. So I'm super excited to take a peek under the hood of how April does this at Microsoft. So April, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for being here today. Really, really excited to be speaking here at, at She Sharp on a Friday afternoon. So hopefully brightening up everyone's Fridays. So I wanna talk about developer velocity and, and how we use tooling in DevOps, how we use it in our skill sets, and really why, why it's really important to us as developers. Um, and there's a really good story with how we do this at Microsoft. I'm gonna talk about that a bit, and then we're gonna go into actually what this tooling is and how we can enable it. So who am I? Um, and as I was introduced, I'm a senior software engineer at Microsoft. So I'm code with, build with customers. I'm actually out there coding and deploying with customers day in and day out. I'm contributing to product groups. I'm doing feedback with them. Um, and my whole kind of career trajectory has been from the ops space into development. So DevOps is really, really close to my heart. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or LinkedIn. And I always encourage you to reach out, ask me questions, you know, either after the show or during the show. I like to keep these things as interactive as possible. So if I was sitting live in front of every one of you today, I would ask you the question to define what is DevOps to you? So take a minute, think about it. Feel free to put comments in the window, um, you know, or shout out loud to your cat or your dog or your family member sitting in the next room. What does DevOps mean to you? Now, when we talk about DevOps to people, everyone has a different definition of what DevOps means to them because, you know, we all have different experiences. But there's a definition we use of how we define DevOps at Microsoft. It's something we use in how we deliver our products, but also with our customers. So at Microsoft, we define DevOps as the union of people, processes, and technologies to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. Now, I want to talk about this word value. Yes, we're trying to ship code. Yes, we're trying to get features out the door and apps and all this stuff. But what is the value? We're not just writing code for the sake of writing code. We're trying to get that value across the line. And it's really made up of these three components. And, you know, it's a three stage conversation when we talk about DevOps. So today we're going to focus on the tooling side, the product side. But I want to touch just real quickly on the other two pieces, because it's a really key part of why the tooling is important and how we leverage it. So Satya Nadella, our CEO, came out and talked about technical intensity. And that's been a big, big topic of conversation for us at Microsoft. And what is tech intensity? And we have this formula of tech intensity. And, and really, if you're not a maths person, it's OK. You don't need to know maths. Um, but it's, it's the tech adoption times capability. What's our technical capability? How, how do we adopt it? And then we put that and multiply that exponentially with trust. Now, Microsoft has a phrase. Microsoft runs on trust. And if you trust your organization, you trust your employees, it enables them to do better and to do more with it. And that's how we get technical intensity. And it's something that we're encouraged highly as engineers at Microsoft to do. And it's something we encourage with our customers when we engage with them, because we want to increase their tech adoption. We want to increase their capability and trust them to run on our platforms and vice versa. So when we talk about DevOps. We, you know, we have this people side of, you know, oh, almost these silos in our organizations where we have ops teams and developers, we have QA teams, and we all work independently. So we want to really break down those barriers and enable that trust. And that's really important. And we talk a little bit about, you know, where do we start with DevOps as a team? And, you know, we have to break down those barriers and those silos. And those people changes are the absolute hardest things to address because, you know, we're going to talk about tooling in a minute, but anyone can talk about tooling. You know, we have all these different tools out there, but no matter what we buy or invest in as an organization, it's not going to fix it. We've got to fix our people. And that's why tech intensity is super, super critical to us. So customers and people at times say to me, where do we start? You know, when we're embracing DevOps. And I said, look, find something that hurts most in your organization and pick that piece and do it more often. Take that thing that hurts most and add it into your DevOps cycle. You get the most value out of that. You know, you can take something that's the biggest pain point in your organization. And let me give you an example. So a lot of developers and operations teams have this epic deployment, maybe once or twice a year, they make these massive feature changes to their application and their operational stack all at once. And this could be done over like a long bank holiday weekend and it's painful. Everyone's on board, you're on call and you know something's going to break and you're making massive changes all at once to the organization. And that that's difficult. And I'll be honest, it sucks. I've been there, I've had those long weekends 
And I don't want to do it ever again, but we, we have organizations that still run epic deployments. So we want to look more how we want to deliver continuously and how we do that in our processes. And that starts with our people, but also then making small changes. So we pick that piece that really hurts most and develop a process to address that. And with each iteration, we make that process better and better. So you're not going to make a change in your process and your people, and it's all going to be great the next day. It's going to happen over time, but we pick one piece and we stick with it. So we plan, we develop, we execute, and then we monitor to see what those changes took place back and then it comes full circle. So the tooling piece is a really super critical part of this, this whole process, okay? So let's get into the tooling because that's what we really want to talk about today. So for those of you that develop in any type of code, you know, Java, Go, even working in PowerShell, Bash, whatever, if you develop in any language, we have a tool called Azure DevOps. Some of you might be really, really familiar with it and others of you might not but allows for any language onto any platform. The reality is most of our customers work in a very, very um, you know, hybrid environment. They're on premises, they're in a cloud. They might be in multiple clouds, whether it be GCP or AWS. Azure DevOps allows our developers and our ops teams and our project teams to develop, to develop and to deploy to any of those platforms. And there's really five components that make up Azure DevOps. So we have Azure Boards, which is like Kanban boards. Uh, it's all your planning, all your agile tools, where you can plan, track, and, and get to kind of see full visibility of the project. You can track your bugs. You can put you know, links in from Azure DevOps to maybe your Teams or email to get notifications and your full end-to-end -end tracking of your project. So when we talk about this big epic deployment. One of the things that we really have an issue with is when something breaks, the finger pointing, the blame comes out. If we have full end-to-end -end tracing and, and, and trackability within our, custom, within our tooling, this will help us determine why things fail and help us deliver those more, you know, uh, continuous deployment, right? We want to be continuously integrating our code, continuously deploying it. So a tool like Azure Boards built into Azure DevOps really helps with that. And that's your project planning tool. So it's great, gives great visibility to the project owners uh, and the developers and their tasks. And, and you can keep everything organized, know where things are progressing in the project or your development lifecycle. So we have a CICD tool called Azure Pipelines, and that's our delivery. And that, again, can go to any cloud. So whether you're sitting on premises, sitting into Azure, or AWS GCP, Azure Pipelines it. We also have Azure Repos. Azure Repos is basically a private repository in Azure DevOps. Now, you can pull from Bitbucket um, or even GitHub into Azure DevOps. You don't have to use the Azure Repos capability. We do work with a lot of customers where data residency is a requirement, and it pulls into the back plane of kind of their Azure um, Active Directory organization. So everything's secured and packaged and they know exactly where their data is sitting. So for that case, uh, Azure repos might be used inherently. Uh, then we think have things like Azure test plans, testing super critical to our code. You know, we wanna test early, we wanna test often because we talk about shifting left. What does that really mean? That means testing our code and using tooling from day one that allow us to write better code, whether that's better, better capability within, you know, to our IDE, like Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, into then testing it locally, then pushing up and testing it in our pipelines. Azure test plans allow us to run test plans, get full traceability of our testing within the Azure DevOps tooling. And then we also have Azure Artifacts. And Azure Artifacts uh, plays into our CICD pipelines. It supports packages like NPM and Maven. So Azure DevOps is pretty much a massive, all-inclusive piece of software that we use at Microsoft. So I did mention that it integrates into GitHub, which is great because there are 50 million users consuming GitHub. So you can hook in your GitHub repo into an Azure DevOps pipeline and start deploying from there. So it's all integrated with extensions and everything else. We're not gonna go into that today. I actually wanna go a little bit more into the GitHub side. And I, I just said a little number a minute ago, it was 50 million developers are using GitHub. It is the largest development platform out there in the world. So let's talk about it because it's important because probably all of us here are consuming it in some way, shape or form, even if we don't think we are. GitHub has really helped people build software. We know that over 80% of customers um, and companies in the world use open source code for non-commercial and even internal reasons. Maybe just think about even maybe your local machine or your day-to-day -day environments that you're working in. You probably have some form of open source software running in your environment. Uh, we also know that over 61% of these organizations are using open source code in commercial products, whether they're pulling a code zip down or a package down from a GitHub repo. People store their projects on GitHub. OK, and that's great. But then what do they do with them afterwards? So while you may not be using GitHub repos for your you know, current company's requirements, you might be using it personally or you might be pulling projects down from there or learning from it or contributing to projects. So there's always an indirect action to GitHub that we find almost every developer has. And it's an open source tool. So we want to enable that for the developer. So 
let's ta talk about GitHub Actions. This has been a hot topic. So I just talked about Azure DevOps. Now we're going to talk about GitHub Actions. Okay. So why GitHub Actions? Again, because so many, so many people are on GitHub day in and day out. So they, the, the people at GitHub want to extend GitHub. GitHub's great. It's a great repo. There's some cool things into it, but it wasn't perfect. And they wanted to make it better. They want to take a platform and extend it where it really made sense for you and me as developers and extend it not to just a place to store stuff, but how we can do more. So once upon a time, we had something called GitHub apps. Now you could build and create things with these apps. You could take two different parts of the platform and then you can mash them up together, leverage it and do something cool with it. So uh, when you had GitHub apps initially, when this first came out kind of like version 1.0, um, you could send a webhook through GitHub when something happens. So you could almost kind of trigger something within your code and maybe someone commented an issue or whatever, um, but GitHub would open up that kind of uh, an HTTP request, open that port up, and then save you a payload of actually what happened to that action or that task, right? So you could turn around and then call GitHub back. And this was great. You could then kind of start building things as you wanted to, but it was really, really limited. So you're calling back to the GitHub servers, whether you made an issue or a comment, and you had a response. And you could do these small little actions. And that's how GitHub apps actually started. So that was cool, but you had to run your own infrastructure. So there's a problem with running your infrastructure. Think about yourself as a developer today. You know, everyone has a production environment. You have some dev tests. You might have some pre-prod canary environments. Most of the time, our dev tests and our non-production environments are not the same as our production. They always find some like dusty box in the corner and say, you know what, have that. So if you wanted to run GitHub apps, you had to do this on your own infrastructure. And let's be honest, your organization is probably not gonna give you a brand new server that's identical to what's running production. They're gonna give you some dusty cobweb box that was sitting in a corner and say, yeah, we don't need this anymore, take that. Or it's like eight years old, okay? So the problem with this is, you've probably got some a bit that's on the more of the legacy side that's been retired from the environment for a reason. You have to maintain it. And that server probably sat in your desk or in a domain in a data center. So it may not even have really good controls around it and someone could step on a power cord and unplug it, like let's be real. So GitHub apps was enabling you to build some custom tooling on top of GitHub but the problem was you couldn't leverage it if your server died and you had to maintain that. And realistically, that costs money, time, effort. But as a developer, we really don't want. So GitHub listened. Uh, we came out with the GitHub Actions beta, where it started as GitHub replacing the apps with actions. So GitHub apps went away, they brought in actions, and then they provided you with the infrastructure at GitHub, which is great, cool. I don't have to host my own box under my desk anymore. We can host this on a GitHub server, and GitHub provided our infrastructure. Cool, I wanna push code, I don't wanna worry about a box under my desk. Now, the problem with this is GitHub Actions Beta ran in a Docker container. Now, people really want to run kind of a build and release process. And as soon as you get more complex code, you were really limited to running that Docker container. You couldn't test against a lot of the real life use cases you're writing code for. Now, if you ever write any applications for maybe uh, Apple or Mac operating systems, you have to run it on that OS to test against. You can't run it in Docker container. So GitHub Actions beta really didn't meet the needs of the developers again. So we had to take some feedback in as an organization and go, right, how can we make this better for everyone? How can we make it better for developers? In came GitHub Actions revamped as we know them today. It now runs three server versions effectively. So this new version, as it is today, as it's been released that you can play with today, runs workflows on any kind of virtual machine, Windows, Linux, and Mac. Now, Azure DevOps does the exact same thing. So if you're developing for any kind of Mac or Apple um, operating systems, you absolutely can test on this platform. If you're, you are know, need to test against Windows boxes or, or Linux, you can do that on this platform as well. Um, you don't have to run that Docker container anymore. So now we have this capability to run for bigger and more complex applications. And this gave parity to Azure DevOps. So that kind of answers the question. I think that's sitting on the back of your, in the back of your head going, well, we've thought about Azure DevOps, we're thinking about GitHub Actions, what's the difference? This was a big piece of it. So this brought up that parity. So you can test on any platform uh, and, and, and test at the source really. So this is great. This is where we are with GitHub Actions. Now, what's cool with GitHub Actions, it's not just CI, CD. And, and, and really the people at GitHub don't want us to think about it as just CI, CD, because it's more than that. It's really automation. It's so you can automate everything. It's, it's kind of that phrase, automate all the things. Like when people ask me, what should I automate first? Automate anything a human can do. 
The human can do it, automate it. If it takes time out of your day, automate it. And this is exactly what GitHub Actions is so, so cool. So yes, we can do you know continuous integration, continuous deployment, and we can test functionality in there, and that's awesome. You know, we have these Linux, Mac, and you know, Windows OS runners in the cloud. Okay, cool, take that box. We can do it based off events or schedule. We have a built-in secret share. So when you know we don't have to put passwords in our code anymore, because let's be honest, that's asking for a data breach. They're easy to write and share, and they're super modular and they're reusable. So we're gonna get into them in a minute, but I want to touch on the security side a little bit because as much as a developer, we don't want to talk about security. We need to secure our software because a lot of the time there's a data breach because someone has left a password out in the open or a plain text file, and we don't want to do that. So there's amazing features for security built into the platform. So as a developer, if we're shifting left, testing our code early, writing better code, and using better IDEs like Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code to do this, they help enable us to do that. But we also need to build security into our code from day one, and that's part of shifting left. So what's really cool on uh, GitHub Actions is that, and in GitHub, when you secure your software um, on any open source project in GitHub where you have code, you can report a security vulnerability for any open source project that you might be attached to. So that's really good. So they have that feedback. There's also scanning built into it. It goes a bit, uh, excuse me, it goes a lot further. So firstly, GitHub has um, something called CodeQL excuse me, code QL built into it, where code is treated as data and it scans your code as soon as it's created, uploaded into that repo. Uh, we also have things like Dependabot. Now, Dependabot's awesome. It, it's a dependency scanning tool built into GitHub in public repos where it automatically opens up a PR with a suggested fix or remediation. So Dependabot can pick up any issues and dependencies in your code that you may not have as a human, which is also awesome. cool. There's also a really great feature uh, for secret scanning in GitHub. Now we've all done it. We've been in a rush, had a delivery deadline to meet, and we may have put a password somewhere where it should have, but we thought no one will find it, right? GitHub has secret scanning. Uh, it scans both public and private repositories and notifies the admins when a password is found. So you might have a password that you may need to put something like Azure Key Vault when you're deploying your application, but said, ah, I'm in a rush, we're just gonna let it go. It pulls that up for you. So you will get a notification as an admin of a repo when there's a security alert. And that's great because sometimes we're in a rush, let's be honest. So using that to fix the code and get a PR generated so we can send that, uh, acknowledge that issue and send that fix across pretty easily. So let's look at GitHub Actions. So we're going to talk about GitHub Actions first. Um, we're going to go into other stuff first. OK, so this is a GitHub page that I have running. Um, this is just the Actions tutorial. And for those of you that may not be as familiar with GitHub, we're just going to go through a few things just to get you a little bit familiar. So I'm on my repo, and I can see that you know about 60% of my code is written in Go. So GitHub has been been scanning my code. It knows exactly what kind of languages I'm using. Um, it sees a Docker file. And we'll come on to the Docker file thing in a minute because that will be important later on. So I have my repo here. I have my code in here. And we're going to create an action. It's really, really simple. We literally just select actions. And here we've already created a couple. Um, so we're going to go through them. But we can maybe want to do a new one. So we hit new workflow. And when we hit new workflow, it does some really cool stuff. So the first thing that it does when I hit the repository piece, excuse me, on the workflow template piece, it's looked at my repository and says, right, you have Go installed. Awesome. Well, here's a suggested workflow. So what this is going to do is set up a GitHub action, set up a workflow where it's going to build and test our, guild, our, our Go code. It's going to build it and run a test for it. Because testing is super critical. It's already built into that workflow for us to get started with. So that's super easy. But maybe we want to go a step further. Or even though we've written our code to go, maybe we want to deploy it somewhere else. So you know, again, this is still going to be multi-cloud focused. Maybe you want to deploy it to Amazon. Maybe you want to deploy it to Azure or GCE or somewhere else. You can absolutely do that or, or OpenShift. So you have this capability to use these basic workflows. There's even a great one for um, Terraform to deploy into Terraform Enterprise. Um, and then you can look at workflows that are based on maybe the type of code you're running. So I said there was a Docker file. I can publish a Docker container. If I have you know, an image I want to push, et cetera, um, I can, if I'm coding in Go <laughs> or Ruby, uh, Java, et cetera, it will pull that up. We can do some other cool things like you know, just do a greeting. 
um, or maybe pull out stale code or do geez, a manual workflow if we wanted to. Um, but maybe I want to do a greeting and maybe the greeting just welcomes someone to my repo, uh, welcomes them in, gives them maybe some ideas of what we're doing in the repo and a little bit of guidance. So I've actually already set one up and let's go into this one. Um, so I have two workflows that will run uh, and I have triggers for them. So if I click on my you can see that my triggers ran successfully and my workflow ran successfully. It's going to open my greetings file. So this is one that I've already pre-created. Uh, but again, that we saw that there was a greetings one that was easy to set up. So this is the basic template and I've added a few things to it. You can always add into it. Now, the actions are going to be based on YAML. So when you're writing out pipelines and triggered uh, CICD pipelines in Azure DevOps, you have the option of that classic editor. So you have that kind of visual rep representation, or you can do it in YAML. In GitHub Actions, it's all going to be YAML based. So we do give you a lot of starting points, but then you can say, right, uh, I have some starting points here. Uh, I have some actions. So you know, first time someone commits their first issue in my repo, you're going to get a message, welcome. And I could put more into my message potentially. I could say, welcome. Um, you know. Uh, we can edit it and say, oh, that's never good. Let's see if we can get that pulled back up. It's never a talk without a tech issue, right? Let's go back to our actions. Open up my YAML again and see if I can edit it now. No, it's not letting me edit it. Okay, so that one's a little cranky, that's fine. I do apologize for that. So this is my main workflow I've created. What this one will do is every time I submit a PR into my repo, um, it's actually gonna run this and it's gonna run some testing. So this is basically that very simple, um, that go one. So let's actually make some changes in our code and see what this workflow does. So we see I have workflows here. I'm just gonna open them up and we'll go for them in a second. But I wanna make some changes, maybe just to my, my code, okay. So traditionally, I like to edit my code in an IDE, like VS Code or Visual Studio. For here, I'm just going to put it in, and we're just going to write some really bad code. There's a prime example. We're going to commit our changes and say update to code. Now, I, can't, I can commit this directly to my main branch, but actually, I want to create a new branch because I want to review my code changes. I don't want to just commit to master. And we can put in rules to, per, to, to, to make sure we don't commit our code right into that master branch. So I run my update to code, um, and I'm going to create a pull request. So let's watch it here because what it's going to do, it's going to look at my branch. It says no base can't conflicts. And then what it's also going to do, it's going to run some checks. So let's let it run its checks. And as you can see, it has our greetings uh, workflow and our main workflow. So we'll just give this a second. So it's already it's already failed these tests and it's running the the uh, excuse me the greetings workflow. So I have committed to this repo before. Um, going to give you a little bit of a you know it's it it it's going to pass. Um, it's not a you know new new repo, but I failed my my tests. Okay, I have all the errors here. I can look at the workflow and I can figure out where my, why my test failed now. We all know why my test failed, so we don't have to go down there. But let's actually look at the workflow and what it's doing. So this is my main workflow. On any time I make a push or a pull request to my main branch, um, it's going to trigger this. OK, so this is my trigger. I'm going to run all my unit tests. So this is running on the Ubuntu latest um, image uh, in the cloud. So we talked about those GitHub Actions being able to do that. I'm running this on, on Linux. So I could run it on Windows or Mac OS, doesn't matter. But I'm going to check out my code. Uh, I'm going to set up my actions. And I'm just going to run some unit tests on my code. So really, really simple. That's all that is. But it's a really simple way to check my code in and, and see how it's working. So that's really good. Um, again, we could create some you know really easy actions. Uh, we could just create a brand new action if we wanted to, going back to the main page. But I can go to my pull request here and say, this update here obviously failed the checks. Greetings, OK, that passed. But then I can't merge this pull request in good faith because I didn't actually pass my tests. So we would abandon this or make changes and re-push our commit up. So that is GitHub Actions. What I want to do is I also want to go through Visual Studio Code Spaces real quickly. So we talk about using an IDE. Now, 
I do usually develop on Visual Studio Code on my machine or Visual Studio, depending on what language I'm working in. And we have this really cool thing called, called Code Spaces. Now, I'm going to give you a little warning here, and you will see this at the top. Visual Studio Code Spaces is migrating away to GitHub Code Spaces in February. And you're thinking, huh, why is that? Well, the reason why this is moving is because there are 50 million developers on GitHub. So what better place to host this than GitHub? Then you have the ability to run your code space next to your code. Pretty cool. So what is Visual Studio Code Spaces? So Visual Studio Code Spaces is running VS Code or Visual Studio in the cloud. So I can pull up a VM that I already have running and I will get a, a full flavor of VS Code in the cloud. Um, when you do open up a new instance, you'll get this readme here. You can go through it. The other cool thing is I can do is I can sync my account, whether it be my GitHub account, my Microsoft account, and I can turn on setting syncs across my local VS Code. Now, I also want to maybe make this workspace portable. So if I do lose my machine and I do need to develop code, or maybe my machine isn't powerful enough, or we want to talk about securing our developer environments, we can spin up code spaces. And we can have an image. If we have a Docker file and we want to run this in a dev container, we absolutely can, and that will be transparent. So while I have this one instance of a machine running, I could be in any browser working anywhere in the world. I don't need my laptop. I can still write and submit my code, and I'll be in that secure developer environment. So maybe my organization said, you know, we want you to have this kind of configuration. We want you to have these kinds of extensions. We can build that into the file. So I'm going to go into creating the code space here. Uh, so we're going to call this. Um, Call this G and L. Um, so we can put a Git repository directly into this. I could copy maybe my actions tutorial, um, or just kind of I don't know maybe another maybe another repo if we wanted to. Now I can choose how much fire, how horsepower I need behind my code space. Now at times we may need less less RAM and CPU behind our code space, other times it may need more. So you could maybe start with a basic build of two cores and four gigs of RAM, and then maybe you know up it. So this is effectively running on an Azure VM in the cloud, but it's fully secure, and you can set the environment, the developer environments, but if you're running on someone else's machine, right? So I can say, you know what, maybe the four cores, eight gigs of RAM is sufficient. The other thing I can do is your build per usage of this. So if maybe my developer goes idle for five minutes, let's go get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, it suspends the code space. And all I have to do is start it back up again. Or maybe we say two hours, allow them to go into a meeting or something. So the one I have running already is in a 30 minute um, suspend after isolation. So we could say, right, 30 minutes, um, and then hit create. So it's gonna import that Git repository into my code space, and we'll be able to spin up that code space in, in VS Code and have that repo already there. So again, in February, I believe it's February 21st is the date, February 17th, sorry. February 17th, 2021, this is gonna be moving to GitHub. So watch this space. So we're creating our whole dev environment um, and we're gonna make this really portable for us, which is gonna be awesome. So while that's creating, we're gonna go back to our slides. All right. So we talked about code spaces and why they're really important. So let's go over the developer tooling that we've kind of spoken about. So I did talk about Azure DevOps. Um, I didn't really show off Azure DevOps. A lot of people use it, um, but I really wanted to show you guys GitHub Actions because you can trigger anything with Actions and there's so many cool things you can do with it. Um, and I want to talk about code spaces because so many times I'm working with customers that struggle in their developer environments. Now, give you a couple cases that I run to frequently. Um, we're all working from home these days. We're given a laptop or device and it's super underpowered and it might be really old. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe your device is, you know, four or five years old or has like four gigs of RAM and you just can't run anything on it and it crashes. Running something in a code space kind of gets you away from that, right? A lot of times if you're trying to run like in a dev container and get all your developers to run in a dev container. So you have those similar environments, you can run local testing, you're really a shift left organization the horsepower behind the machines isn't there. Okay, so we spin up code spaces for the entire team. Cool, that, that's one really good resolution. Another time I've really seen customers struggle is when they've locked down the developer machine so much that they can't install anything. I've worked with customers that can't use Visual Studio Code. Uh, they're still working in Notepad++. And I remember working with them and they're like, we're not allowed to use Visual Studio Code. You're like, okay, well, what, what can we do? We can do Notepad++. I remember seeing them, them for like, one person was working on an issue for like three hours and in VS Code it highlighted it almost immediately. So the built-in intelligence into these IDEs is incredible and it's geared towards the developers. So 
we got them into code spaces because they weren't allowed to put things on the machines. They were so locked down, it was so prohibitive. And I see so many customers like that where the de developers aren't allowed to do those things. And this comes back to that trust conversation. We have to trust our developers and our employees and our teams to be able to do more with what they have. So I want to point out some resources to everyone today because I've thrown a lot at you. Now, Microsoft of old, um, without question, you know, you'd call someone for service or help and you, you kind of felt like if you had a complaint or an issue with the product, it was falling on deaf ears. Now we have azure.feedback.com. Anytime you have an issue, you can submit, you can submit a, a question, a query or a problem uh, through the GitHub repo for Azure feedback. Uh, we have Channel 9 at Microsoft. We also have Microsoft Learn. So if you want to start learning about a lot of the tooling that's out there, a lot of the technology that's out there, MS Learn is a fantastic resource to go to. You can do um, courses and hands-on labs through that. And then looking at um, you know the new code spaces that's coming and GitHub Actions, I just want to show everyone um, a little... See if I can pull it up. Doesn't look like I can pull it up. Uh, the GitHub Roadmap. So the GitHub Roadmap it, roadmap is publicly available. So you can pull in the GitHub Roadmap, open that up, and see what features are coming. Because when, when GitHub Actions, again, was first introduced, it's building, and they're trying to build parity with ADO. But there's a lot of things that we won't see in GitHub Actions, like you know the Kanban-style boards that we have in Azure DevOps, we're not going to have in GitHub Actions. But features in GitHub Actions specifically, you can find on the GitHub Roadmap. You can also look at devblogs.microsoft.com. Myself and a lot of colleagues will publish articles on the latest features in GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps, et cetera. Um, and you know, we have tons of learning resources out there. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to open up the floor for questions uh, from everyone in the audience, and we can go from there. We did have some questions that we'd love to um, jump in on. So is Dependabot or any of the other GitHub security features extendable or customizable? So there. I, if you look at the, the GitHub roadmap, they're doing a lot with Dependabot. So they're constantly doing feature updates for that, keeping the security side of it up to date. They're looking to have it more feature rich for people running in maybe GitHub Enterprise privately as well and private repos. So there's a lot more coming down the pipeline. Um, and I want to say second half of this year, so Q3, what is that, after July, there's gonna be a lot more features coming with Dependabot. I think there's, there's massive recognition of how much people are relying on it and using it now uh, in their code repos. So yes, there's more coming. Amazing. Thanks for fielding that question. Um, what kind of projects are people can people expect to deploy with GitHub Actions versus some of the other like Azure, for example? What are what are like can you give an example of like when GitHub would be preferred or vice versa? So I think you could do cool things with GitHub Actions. So maybe someone starts following your repo and, and kind of like how we had that little greeting ac um, action, you know, welcoming someone to your repo. Here's the readme. Maybe these are the rules of engagement, how you want them to interact with your repo. So you can do small stuff like that just to automate stuff. Um, if you're looking to do more like CI, CD with your code, you know, it really just depends where does your data sit. If your code's already in GitHub, go for it. Use an action, spin one up and see how easy they are because there's so many features built into it. Um, the only downside is if David data residency is a question. Um, so we have a lot of customers that work in very um, specific industries that cannot have their data in the EU. It has to be, I'm, I'm residing in the UK, so data has to sit in the UK. Mm -hmm. Those features are coming, yes. <laughs> they're not there yet. Um, and I think with, unfortunately, the political situation in the world, we've had so many requests. So it is certainly coming. Um, mm -hmm. But it, you know, if your code's sitting in GitHub, spin up an action and see how easy it is. And if you don't know YAML, Again, that's why you have a lot of those templates there. And uh, yeah, get started. Uh, on a similar vein, what other features do you see coming in terms of GitHub Actions? Like where do you see the future of this going? So we always get the question about like Azure DevOps versus GitHub Actions. And we have customers that use both. Um, you know, and there's not always a, a one answer for every organization. It's, you know, what fits best for you or your teams. Um, we're going to see a lot of parity with Azure DevOps. And so I'll give you an, an example. So when I'm deploying a pipeline with Azure DevOps, I have automated everything, but I put in manual approval gates. So maybe when I'm going to my different environments, uh, the, my infrastructure or my, you know, my Azure, you know, resources, I need a visual check and maybe I need visual check from other people on the team. Those mm -hmm. manual gates weren't there before. They're mm -hmm. there now though. So you can add in manual checks to your pipelines and your code, which wasn't there before. So the features are just gonna be increasing. And again, check out that roadmap. So if there's something you use specifically today in either Azure DevOps or another tool, have a look online. 
Perfect. And uh, Caroline asks, is there any word when uh, VS or Azure DevOps will support more ML slash data workflows? So I'm, I'm going to be a little careful with this. So I'm not a massive data person in, as such. Now, we're doing quite a bit with uh, machine learning modeling, and we are using Azure DevOps to deploy stuff, but we're also using a lot of custom scripts to, to configure things as we need to. So I'm currently working on a customer project where we're using things that aren't quite available in the pipeline. So there's a bit of customization, so it's not quite in the marketplace yet. Um, and then data, I mean, we have customers deploying to their databases, et cetera, to Cosmos, SQL, um, and other databases that are out there, especially in Azure. So it depends, you know, when you talk about ML data, is it sitting in Azure, is it sitting on another platform? With Azure, yes, we have quite a bit of features, uh, quite a few features in there that you can use. Um, there should be more coming. Again, we also have a public roadmap for Azure DevOps. And I will apologize, ML, I do work with it quite a bit. We're using a lot of custom tooling. So um, check the roadmap and also give some feedback to the Azure DevOps team in the roadmap. Perfect. Um, more of a silly question. What is the, the funnest or silliest thing that you've automated uh, with GitHub Actions? What are some of those like little hacks that you've built into some of your workflows? Um, this one's a little bit more personal than professional. Um, so you could do something as simple as like account to your repo. How many people visited your repo and you can get stats on it. So because I live in the UK, and I'm not from here originally, but I've been here a long time. I like seeing maybe what country I'm getting like pinged from and where people are watching me. Um, but I'm also starting to use GitHub Actions with home automation. Um, mm. I am renovating my house and we're automating. I mean, I have Home Assistant running in my home and I'm starting to put all my code into GitHub, into private repos. And then I'm starting to automate everything and I'm starting to use Actions. So my husband's like, oh, I want to do this thing over here with Home Assistant. And, you know, he's used if this, then that. And I'm like, yeah. hold my beer, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm doing it through GitHub Actions. So um, I'm starting to automate some of my home stuff, uh, the I, you know, the IoT stuff at home with GitHub Actions. So, oh, that's um, cool. yeah, that's my side project at the moment. <laughs> I think that's everyone's dream side project is to like have their whole house being automated and just being able to kick back. But uh, I'll thank you so much. I'm just trying to see if there's any other questions that have come through the pipeline that we haven't covered. Um, just a question if Home, Home Assistant is open source, is that correct? It is open source, yes. So um, we could go into a whole topic of conversation about this, but yes, Home <laughs> Assistant is open source. Um, I actually am running it off a of Raspberry Pi at the moment. I'm oh, testing cool. that. Um, <laughs> I do have it on a home server as well. And I actually, I, I can run in Azure, but then you, if you lose internet, you're kind of, you know, out of connectivity. Um, uh, you know, if, if my internet goes down, but I am running it off a of Raspberry Pi. I do have it containerized running on my home server. And mm. there's some cool things I'm looking to do with that as well. But then I can run, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to automate quite a few things. And I think also it's, it's silly things. Like when I'm working from home, I might be doing laundry <laughs> and instead of like, Fair enough, me too. <laughs> <laughs> when's the washing machine done? I can ha I can hook up a smart plug to that and create an action. And then uh, that actually can run through home assistant, but then I can do like a GitHub action to like do other things on top of that behind, mm -hmm. behind the scenes. So there's some really cool stuff we can do out there. Um, yeah. it's, 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 it's kind of a rabbit hole thing to do, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we're finally living in the Jetsons era that we had never thought we'd reach, but it's, it is super cool to automate all of those things. I had a question just from myself. I know you mentioned uh, some pain points of, uh, you know, incremental changes versus uh, shipping larger products, uh, projects, sorry. Why do you think orgs still have epic deployments and how do you think you can, sh how we can shift that company culture a little bit? Since I've worked at organizations that have, you know, leaned more heavily into epic deployments and now I'm at a company that's more about incremental changes, but I think it was a long way to get there. So how do you kind of, you know, bring about that change? It, you have to have buy-in from the top down. I mean, that's first and foremost, you need the buy-in. And we're seeing a lot more examples set by the developers. Like, so you pick a point, put pain point in the organization. You're like, hey, I've done it this way. I built something in Azure. I built this cool thing and, and show it. You get that exec buy-in. So getting that exec buy-in is the big thing. Um, the other thing is every time I go in around a customer and we talk about the processes and the, I hear the phrase, we've always done it this way. Yes. And <laughs> every that's time so I hear funny. that. I literally had this conversation yesterday at work. So very funny. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. You always, and, and all of us have heard it. You're like, we've always done it this way. And I just sit there and I'm like, okay, here we go. And I'm like, but why? But it hurts and it sucks and it's terrible. And we get comfortable. It's what we know. And people are afraid of that change. So mm -hmm. by taking that pain point that hurts most and, and tackling that head on, 
you need that exact buy-in. You have to, you know, do a massive culture shift in your organization. And, and you have to really focus on the people side. And the tools and the processes will get you there, but the people are the big piece. So if you get buy-in from your teams, because a lot of times we see customers that, um, you know, people are scared they're going to lose their job. When we see big changes, yeah. it's job security, but we need people more than ever. So mm -hmm. the company has to create that change and say, we want you here. We want to bring you on this journey. Um, and we want to fix this because what's the cost of running this epic deployment? What's the fallout? What's the customer loss? You know, you know, customers, uh, companies are losing several million dollars, pounds, euros on these massive epic deployments, yeah. time, outages, and, and that's the cost benefit. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and one really quick final uh, fun one. What's the most exciting OSS investment from Microsoft, in your opinion? <sighs> exciting. Oh, gosh. I, I I would say our investment into Kubernetes has been awesome um, and containerization. For me, um, my previous team was cloud native. And, you know, we don't want to container all the things, mm -hmm. but um, it is it is going into microservices and then being able to containerize your environments is awesome. And that's actually been massive investment from us that I've really enjoyed working with. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, thank you so much, April. We've thank learned you. so much from your chat today. And uh, for everyone else who's uh, tuning in again for the next session, we'll be back in 15 minutes. And uh, we're looking forward to kicking things off with uh, our next speaker. So thanks so much, April, and hope to see you thank again you. soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.